Welcome. I'm Kevin Scott, one of the story architects of Star Wars The High Republic. This is Dominic Pace, who plays Gekko the Bounty Hunter from The Mandalorian. Hi, I'm Claudia Gray. I write Star Wars books. And you're listening. And you are listening to Star Wars Comics in Canon. The Force is strong with this one. <laughs> Hello there and welcome to Star Wars Comics in Canon, your guide to the wider Star Wars canon through the comic book lens. And to take you on this journey, I'm your host, Mike Burton. And so brings episode 110. So my friends, this week I am tackling the final batch of the Crimson Rain comics, that is Crimson Rain number 5. So that's going to be including Crimson Rain 5, as well as Bounty Hunters 23, Darth Vader 23, Star Wars 24, and Doctor Aphra 21. Now if you haven't tuned into the show before, make sure you go check out episode 97, which was like a prelude to Crimson Rain, sort of the in-between of War of the Bounty Hunters and Crimson Rain, and then check out episodes 102, 104, 106, and 108, and each of those are the subsequent Crimson Rain batches that I have done, so after today I'll have done all of them, and then we can get prepared for Hidden Empire. Now, if you haven't joined Star Wars Comics in Canon before, I go through each of these comics, I go through the general plot details, and along the way I give you additional information of connected content, including characters that reoccur, species, planets, that sort of thing. So it really serves as a guide to the comics without you having to pick them up. If you have picked them up, you kind of get a broader view of the canon, as well as a nice refresher. So with that all in mind, let's delve straight into the first comic, and as I read out the order slightly earlier, we are starting with Crimson Rain number 5, which is called The Scarlet Queen. It was written by Charles Saul, the artist is Stephen Cummings, the inker is Victor Olazaba, and the colour artist is Guru EFX. This issue came out June 22nd, 2022, and the trade paperback collection of the Crimson Rain comics was released August 23rd, 2022. So that all in mind, let's get into the final of this mini-series, and I'll remind you that there is no crawl for this, so I'm going to delve straight into the story. So the story starts on Coruscant at the Imperial Palace. Palpatine calls in Vader because there's a new enemy of the Sith. With the Syndicate War going on, the Knights of Ren stealing the Screaming Key from Fortress Vader on Mustafar, the Red Guards being killed in front of Palpatine, all of it is serving to be a diversion and a distraction. And Palps notes that it must be Crimson Dawn. He then calls in Director Barsha, who's not been in the canon elsewhere, and they confirm that the ISB, the Imperial Security Bureau, have confirmation from Papa Torren, Zarek Besh, and more that Crimson Dawn specifically are to blame and they have evidence for this. Now the reason they're to blame is because all the crime syndicates and everything are fighting for Palpatine's favour. They're trying to replace the Hutt, which is the rumour that Crimson Dawn spread all the way back at the tail end of War of the Bounty Hunters. In short, Kira are convinced to Gracchus the Hutt to betray the Hutt Council and to betray the Empire, and in doing so, it put the Hutts in a bad light, or so it seemed, and then she used that conflict and that confrontation to spread the rumour across the criminal underworld that the Empire are looking for another syndicate to partner with. That's how it all sort of started. The Hutts are not actually being replaced, and the Empire has no desire to change that, so it's all from Crimson Dawn, mainly from Kira. So then it shows that Kira is speaking with her subordinates and confirms that the Empire are slowly figuring out the Crimson Dawn are behind these things, so they need to begin preparation for the next phase in their plan. Then back to Palpatine and Vader, they talk about Kira. They note that Maul must have trained her because she uses Terras Cassie, which is a specific fighting style to combat force wielders, so she uses this in her confrontation with Vader in the War of the Bounty Hunters miniseries at the auction of Han Solo, and Palpatine and Vader also ponder what else Maul may have told her, because obviously Maul being Palpatine's old apprentice, who knows what kind of secrets he was told. And the reason they kind of come to that conclusion is because Vader notes when he fought Kira that her fighting style specifically reminds him of Palpatine. Obviously Palpatine trains Maul, and then Maul trains Kira, it makes sense. So while this is all going on, the Knights of Ren are taking the Archivist to this giant dark side cavern. Basically, she found this secret artifact thing, but she needs someone to help her get there and protect her, so Kira sent the Knights of Ren. Now, inside this dark side cavern, there are some petrified giants. So they're just beings that are giant. They, When I say petrified, they look like they're made out of stone. And so they're trying to work out what to do, and the Archivist says, well, I think we have to activate the key, and then the lock will show itself. 
It's also been confirmed that no one seems to have been in this cavern for like thousands of years, so who knows how ancient it all is. So, Ren, the leader of the Knights of Ren, if you want more information on the Knights of Ren and stuff, listen to my prior episode, episode 109, uh, where I tackle the rise of Kylo Ren, and in doing that I give a lot more information about the Knights of Ren, and also how Kylo Ren became the leader of it, blah blah blah. Go check that out, it's a really good episode. It's a redo of my first episode that I ever did, I changed the format since obviously episode 1, and I've updated things, and there's loads more connections to the Knights of Ren and to that comic in particular, including some High Republic connections, so make sure you check that out. But yeah, so in this Dark Side cavern, so Ren uses his shadow, which is what they call the Dark Side of the Force, on the Screaming Key. It then starts to literally start screaming, and the screaming wakes up the petrified giants whose eyes start to come alive with fire behind them. Then it goes back to Kira. Kira is educating Cadalia and tells her not to trust anyone, but to force transactions. She says that you can't ever rely on someone's trust. You have to either blackmail them or force them into a situation or offer them something that they would want, but really make it something that they need so they won't say no. You have to figure out each individual on a case-by-case basis, but you have to use anything in your arsenal, but it cannot just be trusting they'll do the thing you want them to do. And then Kadalia asks about Margot, and Margot is the Imrugian. And Imrugians specifically, as they have this uh, chalk white skin, they also have these black cracks normally across it. It kind of looks like um, like a petrified desert, in a sense. That's kind of how their skin looks. And Margot is actually created using concept art from Kira, because she was originally going to be an alien, and they chose to go human, probably because it was just easier in production and stuff. But Margot basically tried killing Kira when Kira rose to the leader of Crimson Dawn. Now, she actually tried three times, and on the third attempt, Kira still kept sparing Margot's life and Margot learned to respect Kira but also Margot just wanted to be able to do certain things that she couldn't do prior. Kira lets her do those things so there's no reason for Margot to want to uh, supersede her anymore. But then Kira goes on to say that Gedalia needs to be smart and she has the power of being the heir to two crime syndicates of being in a position of power and she needs to be aware of that. Then an alarm goes off and the Empire have confirmed that they are now targeting Crimson Dawn and specifically the Vermilion. You see plenty of Imperials around the galaxy getting comms. It reminds me of Order 66 but instead of seeing Palpatine's face there and him say those words, instead you get a hollow of the Vermilion. So with all that, Cadalia goes with Trinia, one of Kira's other trusted advisors. So let's go back to the Dark Side Cavern. So the Knights of Ren are trying to fight these stone giants, but the blasters aren't doing any damage. Nothing seems to really be working apart from Ren's lightsaber. The archivist is freaking out, obviously, if these giant things attacking her, and she's trying to avoid them or trying to work out where on earth to put this key she has. And the Knights of Ren are trying to protect her, but it's pretty tough to do. Basra, one of the Knights of Ren, dies, force pushing the Archivist to safety, and then she gets crushed by one of these giant hands. The Archivist continues to freak out and is panicking and things, and Ren grabs her and says, Basra's death is on your hands, and you better make this worth it, because the Knights of Ren are going to stop dying for Crimson Dawn. She does eventually find a giant, and she climbs into its head and finds a mechanical device that kind of resembles a giant heart. She puts the key in, it turns, and then all the giants who are attacking then stop. The heart then glows and then opens up, so the archivist, who's completely astounded by all this, comes to Kira, and Kira says, await contact. Then she pulls out her earpiece and then crushes it, and then speaks to all of Crimson Dawn. And I just want to read out Kira's speech, it's a nice way to end Crimson Reign, and so yeah, here's just a bit of Kira's dialogue from the last two pages. So this is Kira on the Vermilion speaking out to her many followers, and in the crowd you've got Ochi of Bestoon, you've got Deathstick, and you've got lots of other familiar faces. So, Palpatine knows we are hunting him, so now he is hunting us. This day came sooner than I'd hoped, but it was always inevitable. And, because it was inevitable, I planned for it. I have people all across the galaxy, in the Empire, in every syndicate and significant corporation, on every major world, in the Rebel Alliance. They have been bought, persuaded, loved, threatened, blackmailed, lied to, told the truth. They are mine and they are everywhere. I just gave them the same order. The order is one word. Chaos. Chaos for the Empire. Anywhere they can create it. Destruction, disruption, poison down the gullet of Palpatine's machine. And while the Empire staggers trying to set things right, we will prepare for our master stroke. And all of this will, at last, end. This is my hidden Empire. Choke on it. And that is where this ends. It will be continued in the Hidden Empire, where the first issue of that is being released in October, but I'll get into details at the end and how long you'll be waiting till you hear my episodes on the Hidden Empire. So, with that in mind, we move on to the next comic of this batch, Bounty Hunters 23.
So, Bounty Hunters 23, the writer was Ethan Sachs, the artist is Natacha Bustos, and the colour artist is Arif Prianto. It was released June 1st, 2022, and the trade paperback collection is due to be released January 31st, 2023. So, with that in mind, let's get into the crawl. After successfully capturing Vakura, the new leader of the Unbroken Clan crime syndicate, Toonga and her team finally have a chance to rescue the girl, Cadelia, from the clutches of Crimson Dawn. Cadelia is the heir to the warring crime organisations, the Unbroken Clan, and the Mourner's Whale. But unbeknownst to the crew, Crimson Dawn's leader, Lady Kira, has been making counter moves to eliminate the threat to their plans. Enter Dengar, the last assassin they'd ever suspect. Until it was too late. So there is a flashback to Corellia. You've got Dengar who gets beaten by Han Solo in a speeder race. And then Agran mocks Dengar who then beats him with his destroyed speeder's handlebars. Now Dengar is a local of Corellia and the Grand species, they are kind of like goat-headed beings with three eye stalks and ten are coming out of their heads as well. And you see them, they're, I believe in the original trilogy era, but you see them in the prequel era quite a lot. There's one or two senators that are quite famous in the Star Wars universe and a lot of these senators are Gran. Uh, Gran they live like hundreds of years and in the High Republic Adventures comics by Daniel Jose Older, uh, the first batch of them for phase one, in that Yoda goes off with a Gran leader, I think he's called Elder Tromac and he's hundreds of years old as well so uh, that's a Gran. So yes after Dengar was beaten by Han Solo on Corellia it then does flash back to modern day and it shows that he's being roughed up by some Mourner's Whale thugs. It's confirmed that he has no weapons, so he's allowed to speak with their leader, Lord Kamdek. He grabs some food along his way, because it's like this fancy top-end suite of obviously the leader of this crime syndicate, is to be expected the kind of thing they're eating, and Kamdek demands answers. But Dengar doesn't play ball. He makes him wait so that he can eat, because obviously all this food around him is completely exquisite. Meanwhile, Toonga tries to interrogate Vakura, but Vakura is completely unfazed and just not scared by Toonga or by her wife, Losha. He goes back to Dengar. After indulging in a lot of the food and wine and that sort of stuff, he threatens Kamdek. Kamdek laughs at him and Dengar mentions that he's always underestimated and Dengar confirms that there are Crimson Dawn agents everywhere. Then the waiter brings him a blaster and he stabs a guard nearby with the bones of a fish that he was eating and then shoots Kamdek right in the head. A big shootout occurs in this mourner's whale suite or penthouse or whatever you want to call it and the artwork for this part is really, really good. It's a lot of pages of action and things but eventually Dengar manages to dive out of the window and lands on a ship flown by his girlfriend, Manaru, who is quite a major part of his life in Legends. In canon, we're only just now getting to know her a little bit in bits and pieces here and there. So Dengar and Manaru then celebrate because they've got a bit of wine that he stole, but he notes that tomorrow will be hard. So it goes back to Tonga. Tonga hears of Kamdek's death, and she's incredibly upset by this because he was the one who's going to pay her once she returned Kedalia back to him. She's now worried about the crew that she's with and what's going to happen. So she has no option other than contacting Syfak. Syfak is the bounty broker. He was last seen with Dengar and he's actually been in the Dr. Afro comics. He's also been in the Bounty Hunters comics and things like that. He's quite a new character, but yeah, bounty broker is fairly self-explanatory. So Syfak confirms that he does have a contact, someone who has had associations with Crimson Dawn before and someone who has been on the Vermilion ship. And that person is Dengar. And so that is where it all ends, is Dengar meeting with Toonga and Bosk and Losha and the rest of the crew, and then basically preparing to go and take on Crimson Dawn. So that's where that issue ends. I did kind of speed through it a little bit because there's quite a few action scenes and there's a lot of dialogue from Dengar, which is basically him just saying that he is underestimated and those sort of things. If you want to hear more information about Dengar and stuff, just pick up this comic. It is a good bit of fun, but you know, I do want yourselves to pick up the comics because I do want there to be something that you gain when you actually physically read these rather than me listening to the talk about them all the time. But yeah, if you love Dengar, this is a must read really for the canon. But moving swiftly on, let's get on to the Darth Vader comic. So this is Darth Vader number 23. The writer is Greg Pak, the artist is Rafael Ienko, and the colour artist is Carlos Lopez. It was released June 1st, 2022, and the trade paperback collection is due to be out January 10th, 2023. So with that in mind, let's do the crawl. Darth Vader has revealed to Ochi of Bestoon and Sabe that he's been aware of Ochi's treacherous ways and is using him as a pawn in his battle against Crimson Dawn. Now, Sabe has potentially revealed a secret of her own. She may know who Vader really is. 
So the issue starts with Sabe just saying to Vader that she knows he's Anakin Skywalker. She's noticed his obsession with order, as well as he like ripped open Padme's grave just to try and find out her cause of death, and he hasn't killed Sabe yet. And also she heard Padme's last words, where she says there's still good in him. So she confronts Vader, and obviously she is correct. Vader asks what she wants, and she mentions that after Padme saw of the horrors that happened to Shmi Skywalker, after the the Republic basically failed to go in there and stop slavery, she basically organised lots of people to go to Tatooine and free some slaves. Now when Padme organised this, Sabe was the one who went and did that. Now, this is somewhat detailed in I believe it's either Queen's Peril or Queen's Shadow, basically one of the E.K. Johnston Queen's trilogy of books. It does get detailed in there, even Baru Lars, who obviously is Luke's auntie, even she gets involved with freeing some of the slaves and things. So Padme did do good after Anakin promised when he was a young boy to go back to Tatooine and free the slaves, which obviously he didn't. So when Sabe goes off and does these things, she does it with someone called Tonra. Now Tonra is seen in Darth Vader 3, 4 and 5 in the 2020 run, and as I mentioned is in Queen's Peril and Queen's Shadow, and there's a guy called Richard Armitage, who is an actor in real life, uh, and he appears in The Phantom Menace, and E.K. Johnson says that this character of Tonra is meant to be the nameless character that he played, has been confirmed by Star Wars, but no one's disputed it or anything, so it's kind of canon for the time being at least. So yeah, Sabe and Tomra managed to free lots of these people, but now these people who have made a colony for themselves on another planet, they are in danger. And that's because the leader of the planet, basically a governor who is employed by the Empire, who works for Crimson Dawn, is neglecting them completely. So Sabe says, look, Vader, you come with me, you can eradicate this cell, you help people out, and in doing so, you get rid of Crimson Dawn. It's a win-win. So Vader agrees. So Vader and Sabe then leave, and the planet they're on, Ochi of Bestoom was there, along with Bela Valance, and the rest of those group, the people who are trying to hunt Crimson Dawn and things, and Vader and stuff just leave without saying anything. Ochi then decides to go and continue the mission, he gets in a TIE fight and flies away, and Valance says, look, I just want to rest and have a break, let's all go to the nearby Star Destroyer, let's get some food and some rest before we continue on with what we're doing. So it goes back to Vader and Sabe. So they head to this colony on a moon that's nearby, and before they confront the governor on the Star Destroyer, they land, because Vader wants to check if Sabe is lying or not. So then two individuals are there, and they're two people that I really did not expect to see ever again, if I'm being completely honest. One of them is Kitster Benai, and the other one is Wald. Now, Kitster was the name of a child who is in The Phantom Menace, and when Anakin is playing around with his pod racer trying to get it going, Kitster says things are so wizard, and then Wald is a Rodian child who basically laughs at Anakin. So those two characters have survived for this entire time for those decades ago, and Sabe and Padme and a few others helped them leave a life of slavery, and now they're living on this planet trying to fight Crimson Dawn. So with Kitster and Wald, they're there with some weapons, and they want to rise up and fight the governor. Vader and Sabe get there, and their droid speaks to an astromech droid that's there, and the droid confirms that only 37% of critical supplies have been sent down from this governor who's meant to be taking care of people. Plus, they actually forced 33 people to conscript into the Imperial Navy who have never seemingly returned. So they're basically abducting people, forcing them into the Imperial service to fight a war, while also starving the people who are left on this colony. Vader then has a little look around and he sees that they've made a speeder from pod race parts, which obviously you can tell affects Vader in certain ways. And then he looks around and he goes into the forest that's nearby and some monsters attack. There's some quite cool action scenes of Vader just cutting down lots of monsters and things, and he even saves Kitster and Ward from some of these monsters and just wipes the floor with all of them. It's confirmed that these monsters seem to be dehydrated, and that's because the planet is drying up, again being blamed on this governor who's part of Crimson Dawn who's just screwing the whole planet over. So Sabe said, do you believe me now? I've proved all this stuff to you. And Vader agrees. So Sabe says that she then wants to attack the governor, and Vader allows Sabe to use some of his equipment and things to suit up. She grabs a lot of weapons, she grabs some Imperial Army gear and things, and she now has a degree of extra protection, but she now looks a lot more Imperial. Vader then tells her that the others must obey her or him, because otherwise this whole plan will fail. And she confirms that it will get done. And then the final panel is her wearing her new Imperial armor. So that's where Darth Vader number 23 ends. This has some great dialogue in it, some really cool flashbacks, and seeing Kitster and Wald there was just something that blew me out of the water. So definitely if you're a pretty cool fan, pick up this run of Vader comics, it's brilliant. So let's move on to the next issue, which is Star Wars 24. 
It's written by Charles Saul. The artists are Ramon Rosanas and Madebek Musabekov, and the colour artist is Rachel Rosenberg. It was released June 8th, 2022, and the trade paperback collection was out the 13th of September, 2022. So here is the crawl. As Zara executes her devastating plan on the rebels from the command position of the Tarkin's will, Kez Dameron and his team rescue his wife, Shara Bay, from her cell on board. Together, the team of rebels wreak havoc on the Empire's Star Destroyer from the inside, forcing the Imperials to abandon the ship as it goes down in a fiery blaze. But Commander Zara doesn't give up that easily. Now this issue is one which once again has a fair few action scenes, so I would recommend picking this up to get the full experience. But with that in mind, let's get into things. So Leia, Chewie, Kez Dameron, and then a small handful of rebels I believe are in the Pathfinders, land on Panissia. Leia mourns the death of the rebels, seeing like bits of ash and things around, which show when Zara's Star Destroyer got really close to the planet, ignited their engines, and then it basically just burnt everyone who was there. And Leia notes that Zara took joy in killing them. Then Leia gets a comm, and it is Zara, who has confirmed that she's let off a smoke signal to tell them where she is. They look up and see some blue smoke in the distance, and then Starlight Squadron are nearby, with Shara Bay and Laula Lampar in amidst them, and they fly over to see where this signal is coming from, but Zara is in a cave, so they can't help. So Leia and the group then go to the cave, and then she starts to create a plan of action. Then Zara comes again. Zara confirms that she's got some rebel secrets that she took from Shara Bay that she still has on her on a data card, and she's going to send it up to Imperial Command unless they find her within the hour. Obviously, luring her in, and Kez does note that this is very clearly a trap. So they enter the cave, there's about six or seven rebels in total, including Chewie, Leia, and Kez, and there's some squishy stuff on the floor, and they note that it is animal droppings, and they seem to be these kind of bat things. Now, these animal droppings seem to be 80% Tabana, so they're very explosive. Now, Tabana gas is actually used in hyperdrives, in weaponry, and is actually a coolant for gravitoactive elements of repulsor lifts. So in the Star Wars universe, it is very much needed. Now, you can find Tabana gas primarily in Bespin and a place called Krill Door. Now, also with Tabana gas is that when Han Solo was frozen in carbonite in Bespin, the actual gas that was used to freeze him in carbonite was Tabana. So Tabana is used in lots of places. So the group of rebels, after they note that the floor is basically explosive, they pull out some blades. And then Zara, who is in the shadows, mentions something to them and then shoots the ground beneath them with a blaster. Three of the rebels that are with them just immediately get evaporated by this explosion, but Kez, Chewie, and Leia just manage to avoid the explosion and are basically unharmed, apart from Chewie's arm being on fire a little bit, which he then pats out. The trio then continue throughout the cave system looking for Shara. They come to this cavern area where there's quite a sharp cliff, and then Zara jumps out on them. Zara knocks Leia off the edge, hits Kez, and he goes to the floor, and she also hurts Chewie by swiping at him with a blade. She tells Chewie that he belongs in the mines with his family and then tells Kez that she's going to kill Shara Bay as well. Chewie pretty quickly gets up after being slashed by that blade, picks up Zara and throws her off the edge that she just kicks Leia off. Leia lands in the water beneath this cliff edge and then she starts to swim to shore and some of these creatures start to attack and somewhat eat her a little bit. They're like bats, almost giant bats, and they all start to attack her. She's trying to pull them off and things, but there are quite a lot of them. And Zara approaches with a blade and then slashes at and kills lots of them. She confirms that she wants to be the one to kill Leia, but she also wants to gut her like an animal and hang her upside down with her organs spilling out. So it's, it's pretty graphic. Leia and Zara then have a back and forth and then a creature spits at Zara and this massive glob of spit sticks Zara to the wall. The creature that did this is actually a version of these bat kind of things, but these bat things were, their bodies were like the size of your hand, whereas this other creature is massive, their body is like the size of a bus. The creature then goes up to Zara and starts like preparing to eat her and she's like screaming out to Leia saying, are you going to let this thing eat me? And then Leia just kind of stands and stares and then a few blaster bolts hit this creature and it shows it was Chewie and Kez that have shot at this creature. It hasn't been harmed in any way, but it scurries off into these shadows. Leia then grabs Zara's blade, slices at the middle of her, and it doesn't hurt Zara at all, but it opens up the spit and she pulls out the data card. She then tells Zara that the Death Star was not revenge or anything. The Death Star was a plan they already had, but the fact that Alderaan was blown up means that Leia has no regrets and does not regret killing Tarkin either. 
So Leia then just leaves Zara there, stuck to the wall. And Zara is like screaming out and things, saying we can't do this. And Leia comments that there's different types of justice. And Leia, Kez and Chewie leave the cave. And the last things you see within the cave is Zara screaming and the eyes of this giant creature lighting up right near her. So Leia, Kez and Chewie are then there, standing as they watch the rebel fleet kind of come into atmosphere, ready to pick them up. And they all just hold each other and are thankful that the whole endeavour is over. And that is where Star Wars 24 ends. So we're going to move on to the final comic of this batch, which is Dr. Aphra 21. I will say with Star Wars 25, it's a very special issue. It has like four mini stories in there as well. They are quite cool stories. I have read it. When I finish talking about Aphra and stuff, I'll then delve into what's going to be coming up and what I'm going to do about future issues and things. So without getting too ahead of myself, let's get into Dr. Aphra 21. It was written by Alyssa Wong. The artist is Mink Yu Jung and the color artist is Rachel Rosenberg. It was released June 29th, 2022 and the trade paperback that collection is due to be released December 27th, 2022. And as a reminder, there is a hardcover omnibus collection of this run of Dr. Afro that is due to be released May 2nd, 2023. So let's delve into Dr. Afro. Here is The Crawl. The race is on for Ascendant Tech. Rogue archaeologist Dr. Afro and smuggler Sana Staros have been tasked with collecting ancient Ascendant Tech by Domina Taig. Having made their way to Barleth University separately, Kofon, Faris, Afra, and Sana engaged in a lively discussion with their old professor, Sava Nos, about the Spark Eternal, a piece of tech that grants tremendous Sith-like power. While trying to take the spark for herself, Afra is possessed by it, and now she is something else entirely. So, the issue starts with Afra's body being controlled by the Spark Eternal. Her mind is conscious, but powerless to actually control her body, and you can see the Spark Eternal and Afra sort of talking inside her head. The Spark knows everything that Afra knows, and so Sana confronts and tries to shoot at Afra. Sana's blaster bolts hit her in the arm, but then the Spark Eternal heals her arm pretty instantly, which obviously shocks Sana. The spark being a part of Afra now approaches Kofon Faris. Before it reaches Ko, Sana Staros manages to pull out the ascendant whip that Ko was using earlier and flings it onto Afra, and it seems to incapacitate her slash the spark eternal for a moment and they collapse to the floor. Sana then approaches the seeming corpse of Afra, and then the spark makes a comment and then blasts Sana with an energy blast that flings her across the room. Ko then throws a lantern at Afra and it burns the spark. But then the spark uses a thought dowser on Ko, trying to force them to do something. But Sana then hits Ko over the head and then shoots the spark's hand. Hitting Ko made the thought dowser connection fail, and then shooting the spark's hand made the spark drop the thought dowser. Sana is carrying Ko as a fireman's carry over the shoulder and manages to leave. And it shows that Sava Iglantine Noz is dead on the floor with a knife in her back. As Sana is trying to escape, she's blocked by someone, and that is Boosh, the bounty hunter hired by Domina Taig, who is the one who Leia impersonates in Return of the Jedi. So Boosh is there with their crew of fellow Ubis, and they're going to take Sana and co. to Domina Taig. While this is going on, we get to see what Just Lucky and Ariel Yu are up to. They are talking on Canto Bite, and when Delphis is putting a lot of pressure on them to do things, and they're getting a little bit suspicious about it. Then Just Lucky says they need to talk about what happened aboard the Vermilion. So it does a little flash to when they're on the Vermilion, and it confirms that Kira offered them to join Crimson Dawn, but they would have choices, because working for Wendelphus, they don't have any choices, because Wendelphus preys on orphaned children, forces them into be killers and into a line of work they don't want to be in, and then they owe them forever. And Kira wants to take that away. She also wants to take tyranny wherever she can, primarily focusing on the Empire. Ariel Yu is tempted by this, but Just Lucky is unsure, and so they said they're going to make their minds up and leave. And then in present day, Just Lucky says before trying to make a decision on Crimson Dawn that he has one final big job, and if him and Ariel do that, they'll have enough money to retire. And Ariel says, it's never that simple. So back to Sana and Co. They are now with Domina Taig, and Taig asks about Dr. Afra, and they explain the whole situation that the Spark Eternal and that the greed got the better of Afra because she obviously grabbed it herself. And so Domina says to Sana, well, you need to go find Afra and the Spark. Two birds, one stone. Go get them both. While she's talking to Sana, she walks over to a house plant and pulls out this little eye thing, and it shows it's a hidden camera, which had been put there by her nephew, Ronan Taig. She obviously destroys the camera and then continues speaking with Sana. Domina says that Boosh and crew are going to go with Sana and Sana says, no, actually, I'm going to put my own team together. And the team that she puts together include Afra's dad, Corin, 
Vulada, who's the one from the Worse Among Equals arc of the 2016 run of Afrocomics. I talk about that in episode 55 of Star Wars Comics and Canon. They are, I think, issues 26 to 31. Uh, Vulada, she's like a young blonde girl, and she has this big monster thing called Gertle, who is amazing. In addition to Vulada and Corin, they also get Ustachia, who is the Miriellen individual from the first arc of these 2020 Afrocomics. They also get Deta Yao, who is also one of the people from those Afrocomics. She's the one who had like hidden blades and things and was pretty ruthless in killing, but was kind of pretending to be like a young, innocent student. And then the final person getting for this team is Magna Tolvin, which is Afra's number one love interest, who is a antagonist and then somewhat of an ally in the 2016 run of Afra Comics. And Magna is currently working with the Rebellion. And that is where this issue ends, which is Sana getting her team together, trying to then track down Afra and the Spark. So that is the end of Crimson Rain number five. So there are no more Crimson Rain comics after this. However, there are some more tie in issues going forward that kind of lead in, that kind of wrap up the events of what we had in this batch of comics that I've been doing and then kind of lead into the final crossover of these comics, which is going to be the Hidden Empire crossover. So what have we got coming up then? Well, next week I'm going to be tackling the Obi-Wan Kenobi miniseries. So there's five issues of those and each of them kind of span a different part of Obi-Wan's life. So it's going to be cool to tackle those. I've already read a few of them. Then the week after that, which should be the 22nd of October, I'm either going to do the IDW publishing Ghosts of Vader's Castle, or I may not. I may just continue on with some of these comics and things. I haven't fully decided uh, because obviously I want to release something for Halloween, but I, I have ordered the Tales from a Rancor Pit. And if that arrives before the 31st, then I was planning on doing uh, Ghosts of Vader's Castle on the 22nd and then Tales of the Rancor's Pit on the 29th. But if the Rancor Pit comic doesn't come, then I will just do Tales of Edith's Castle. So I will figure that out. I'll probably have a better idea of that next week. But then going forward with the crossover comics and things, obviously Star Wars, Bounty Hunters, Darth Vader and Dr. Aphra. What I'm planning on doing is doing a couple of batches of things and putting some together. I'm going to wait just to see with Hidden Empire when that starts and the issues that get released around that time because what I'm kind of planning on doing is doing one episode where I tackle sort of three issues from, say, Aphra and three issues from, say, Darth Vader just to kind of wrap up those in-between storylines between Crimson Reign and Hidden Empire but doing like two batches in one episode because if I try and do another four then it's just going to be too much and then Hidden Empire will have already been out for quite a while and I'm going to try and do Hidden Empire within a month or so of release Um, and also a contributing factor to that is because Star Wars number 25 is kind of its own thing there's also a Star Wars comic called Revelations that's coming out shortly and I think that's going to connect some dots as well so once I've got those comics I mean I've got Star Wars 25 but once I've got the next batch of comics of Aphra, Vader, Bounty Hunters and Star Wars then I should have a good idea of where they're going to go I think each of them are going to have three or four issues of like a sort of in-between arc and wrapping things up so when that happens yeah as I said I'll try and do two per episode but I may end up having to do one sort of special episode on Star Wars 25 and Star Wars Revelations but I may include them in just one Star Wars episode where I do Star Wars 25 up to I think 30 or 29 I think is when it's going to start connecting to Hidden Empire again uh, and then also do Revelations in that but I will figure that out in addition to those things I am going to do the Midnight Horizon book review. I am on the final sort of part of the book now. I'm not far from the end, so I am slowly getting there. Uh, and in addition to obviously my Obi-Wan Kenobi series, the Ghost of Vader's Castle series, that's Clone Wars Battle Tales as well. And then the High Republic is starting up uh, this month as well. I know some people have already got Path of Deceit, uh, so I'm hoping to very quickly finish Midnight Horizon before I delve into that. But I have pre-ordered uh, the other High Republic books. It's just in the UK, we seem to be getting the High Republic books a week or two later than America, which is quite a pain, but our well but that's generally what you can expect from me going forward things that i've been involved with i was on uh, frank burton's i like the sound uh, so there's a link to that in the description uh, myself ria megan and spider dan did disney discussions we did the weird and wonderful ones and that's on the feed of spider dan and the secret boars a link to that is in the description uh, i'm still doing the and or discussion show uh, obviously i um, host that with jack of i'm jack's musings who's a pop gorilla and a member of the comics emotion family and we are taking alternate goes on hosting and so the day before this episode drops so yesterday my episode will be released and i believe i'm chatting with the podfather himself dave horrocks about episode five of andor so that's gonna be very excited to tackle that as well in addition to that 
I was also on the She-Hulk discussion show of episode 6, I believe, no, episode 7, which obviously was on the feed of Comics Emotion as well, and I also appeared on the Ike's Flame podcast to talk about the High Republic in, like, phase 1, basically, in itself and the many things I love about it. It's about an hour-long discussion, it was really good fun, so make sure you check out that link too. So those are all the things I've been involved with recently. Make sure you subscribe to my YouTube channel, youtube.com slash genuine chit chat. You get video versions of a lot of my conversations and all my Star Wars episodes are in lots of different playlists. You can just click on the playlist all about Vader or Afra or Crimson Rain or any of those things or just conversations I've had with people about Star Wars. Make sure you check that out. And if you want to support me, please make sure you subscribe to Comics in Motion. You subscribe to my YouTube channel, Genuine Chit Chat. You subscribe to Genuine Chit Chat as well. Have a fun hat trick of all those things. As well as you can rate and review on the various podcasts podcasting places including good pods and apple podcasts those sort of things share with your friends on social media tell your friends about it in real life and then the final way you can support the show is by going to patreon.com slash genuine chit chat for as little as one pound a month you get access to hours and hours of exclusive content and myself and megan have just started our spooky season so we're watching a lot of horror films and doing little 15 minute reviews of those well i say 15 minute some of them are 15 to 20 minutes a couple of them are like eight minutes so it's a bit of a mixed bag but i'm trying to release more than one of those a week we've already recorded scream as in the original we're going to watch the other three screen movies we've watched hocus pocus we watched halloween kills and we're also going to watch a bunch of other movies we've got on the list so it's all very exciting stuff so if you want to help support the show for as little as one pound a month get access to hours and hours of additional content and also there's legends book reviews on there as well darth bane one and two uh, darth plagueis shatterpoint i'm going to be doing darth bane number three soon as well plus i'm going to start getting into my audiobooks again uh, so i've got a lot of star wars audiobooks lined up including there's a couple of old republic ones there's a couple of other big hitters of the legends world including the x-wing books and darth maul shadow hunters out as well which is narrated by sam whitwer who narrated maul in the clone wars and in rebels and is known for doing the force unleashed which is my favorite star wars game and one of my favorite pieces of star wars content ever so if you want to hear me talk about those things and stuff each of my reviews are normally about half an hour sort of long the book reviews they're slightly less organized than the ones i release on this main channel but you still get all of my thoughts spoiler free to begin with and then at the end i give some plot details so if you want to expand your knowledge of legends it's a really really good way to do that and support the show but that's gonna be enough for me my friends thank you so much for listening as always i appreciate each and every one of you listening all the way to the very end of this rambly nonsense please make sure you subscribe to comics in motion check out all the other amazing shows on there subscribe to my youtube channel check out all the other videos i do and also check out the many collaborations i've done links are in the description to all of those so thank you my friends i'll talk to you next week with the obi-wan kenobi mini series and as always may the force be with you The intro for Star Wars Comics and Canon is arranged by myself, Mike Burton, and the backing music was made by Eric Matias of soundimage.org. You have just experienced host, creator, everything else of genuine chit-chat, and also the host and creator of Star Wars Comics and Canon, found on the Comics in Motion podcast, Mike Burton.